Welcome to Australian Taekwondo Talk, where we meet the people who make our martial art great. Brought to you by Ageless Taekwondo, part of the Move It Oz initiative, a modified program for over 65s that's accessible, affordable, and implemented in a community setting. Stay tuned to find out how you or a loved one can get involved. Kananara is home to just over 5,000 people. On the edge of the Kimberley, near the Western Australia Northern Territory border, it's an agricultural, mining and tourist town. And for 25 years, at the very heart of that community, has been Kananara Taekwondo Club. How does a club survive, let alone thrive, in such a small community? And what can we learn about how a martial art run out of the local leisure centre can connect across generations in a remote Australian township? Sue Riley is a third Dan and longtime lead instructor at Kananara. Welcome to Australian Taekwondo Talk, Sue. And welcome to you, Aaron, and listeners. You aren't in Kananara right now, are you? No, no. In December, my husband and I relocated back to Albany after 30 years in Kununurra. Why? It's a bit of a funny story, like a lot of other people who go to the Kimberley back in 1990. We went up there for what we thought was four months during the closure of the local meatworks at the time in Albany and just never came back. We were going to come back when our son started school but didn't, et cetera, et cetera, and then he's left. And um, we have elderly, elderly parents and just thought we would retire a bit earlier and make our way back to Albany. Was that a difficult decision to make? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. My husband had worked for 27 years in his job that he had, and he was just a a major part of the community. Um, We couldn't go shopping for a quick half-hour shop. It was always an hour and a half because every shopping aisle we would be stopped, and that's the nature of a small community. And for me, Taekwondo had been part of my life for so long to hand over the club to other people, you know, was – it wasn't hard because I, f- I felt the time was right, but it was my passion and just letting go sometimes was a- wasn't quite so easy. There's a lot of threads there that I want to pick up throughout the course of our conversation today. But in order to understand your Kununurra Taekwondo journey, we probably need to understand your Taekwondo journey first of all. How did you discover Taekwondo? It um, all started with the Karate Kid. Ha! Well, that's new because nearly everyone else says Bruce Lee. So we've moved on a decade to the Karate Kid. No, that's right. Well, my um, my son had watched the whole series of the original Karate Kid series and he wanted to do karate, but there wasn't karate in town that I knew of. But someone mentioned Taekwondo. Well, I'd done Tai Chi and I thought Taekwondo was like Tai Chi, so I ummed and ahed, but we went along and watched it. It turned out to be a little bit like karate, so we thought we would join. And back then in 2000, 2001, I think it was, so long ago, the club used to train in what we call the undercover area at the local high school. And so it was, um, it was just a cement pad with a cover over it. And when we trained during the wet season and when it was um, pouring with rain, we could only really use half the middle centre of the court because the outside edges were just absolutely sloshed with water so you would slip. And we trained in that area for six months before moving to the local leisure centre because by that time there had been enough people training to actually move into the leisure centre. But I was getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, so I'd go and sit and watch him because the class was for an hour. Now I'm 15 and I thought, oh, heck, I'm, you know, I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. I may as well give it a go because there was another lady there older than me at the time who was doing it. And so I thought, well, if she could do it, I probably could. And so joined. And then 12 months later, my husband joined in as well. And so there were three of us, myself, my husband and my son doing it. And we all got to um, a black belt level 
So literally, a mum who discovered Taekwondo from trying to beat the Mozzies. Uh, yes, that's right, which started with the Karate Kid. So an interesting um, pathway, really. <laughs> it's one thing to find it. It's another thing to fall in love. What spoke to you when you finally discovered it? I, and I still struggle with this. I'm totally uncoordinated. So if a, if someone has to do a block five times, I have to do it 20 times to get, get right and get the feel right and get the muscle memory and the brain functioning properly. And I had no idea about the differences of the kicks and I was outside practising one day and um, my son and the husband were watching from the kitchen window and then I heard this laughter. They were laughing at me trying to do this roundhouse kick and this side kick and getting it all totally wrong. And at that time, I could barely lift my knee above my waistline. And I just, I don't know, it was a moment. Um, And it wasn't a moment of love. It was a moment of, I'll show you. Yes. I can do this. Sort of. So in a way, it was probably very good that they were laughing at me, but I still haven't quite forgiven them for it. But... (laughs) So that that's actually what sort of got into it. And just the more I did it, the more I fell in, in love with it. I really enjoyed it. And it was the challenge of actually achieving it. And it wasn't anybody else's challenge but my own because if, I, if I'd compared myself to all the younger ones on it all the time, I would never have got there because – Um, I'm not physically challenged as such, but I'm not a natural at it, you know. So it just morphed into the fact that I just really enjoyed doing it for myself because every time I went up a belt level, every time I got a bit better kick, every time I did a block stronger, that was my achievement. No one else, no one else could do it but me. And that's just how it's been. If you pick another sport, say cricket, If you're not immediately good at hitting the ball, then you're out. Go and sit in the stands or even it's impossible to continue to practice catching the footy in exactly the same way. But there is something about the repetition and the personal perfection of the process that is quite unique in Taekwondo or martial arts more broadly. That's right. There's so many different elements to the Taekwondo. So you can always practice by yourself some element of it. There's your line work, you know, that's where you learn your your, your blocking and your, your punching and your kicking and everything like that. You can still do that by yourself. You don't need anybody there to go at work against. So even when you play tennis, it's your achievement, but you're playing against someone to beat them. You know, you have your sports taekwondo, which is your sparring section, where you do need an opponent, but you don't need that opponent to practice with all the time and to move forward in the ranks. You're not relying on somebody else to compete against to move forward and to become better. And I think that's what I really liked. You know, your pumse that you can do, you can practice those at home over and over again. And you don't need anybody else there to do it. And when you do perfect it and you do get it right, it's your achievement. You're not relying on someone else to get you there. Do you think the fact that, and I'm paraphrasing you here, the fact that you weren't a natural, that informed the way you work as an instructor? Oh, most definitely, because I had a tendency to try and give a little bit more information knowing that I needed more information and needed to know about why you lift your knee higher. Some people who are natural will just do it and they and it's nothing against them. I, I love watching natural athletes, but if you're trying to get to a certain point and be the best you can, you need a little bit more information sometimes to work out how to get to that point because your body won't let you do it unless you're given that extra information. So I have tried, when I was an instructor, tried to be like that. Escaping the mozzies and having a go is one thing. Escaping the mozzies, having a go and sticking at it is another thing. Escaping the mozzies, having a go, sticking at it, becoming a lead instructor and getting to third, Dan, that is a serious commitment. Why did you dive so deep, do you think? It was just another one of those things that I didn't think about it too much. I was the club's third instructor and when the second instructor um, said that he wanted to move on to other things, he'd given four years to the club. I was a black belt at that point. I was going for my second Dan and and I'd started instructing a few clubs and at that time I had been instructing the juniors, the six to nine-year-olds for three years. 
So I thought, okay, I reckon this is something that I can do. I'll take it on. There were two students that at the end of the year would have been um, able to grade for their black belt and they were quite good students. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it for 12 months to get these two kids through. Well, one left town, the other, the other one um, decided that he didn't want to go through anymore and and I was doing it. And then I got some students that came along who were very encouraging and they were adults and they enjoyed it. So thinking that I'd only have about three or four kids and I'd have these two guys who'd got to their black belts at the end of the year, I would only go for 12 months, but it turned into nine years and the club never really looked back at any point I was just quite quite surprised about it and we had some very skillful people come in we had some long-term students I had a a great committee behind me because we um, I chose not to run it as a a business I chose to run it as a community-based club with a committee behind me, treasurers, secretary, president, to help support me in decision making and things like that. And for me, that was just a godsend because it would have been, for me personally, I would have found it a bit hard, I think. I don't know how the other two did it when they worked full time and then run that as a part time business, the other two instructors. But And I don't regret having the community, uh, community-based um, situation. I want to talk more about that, but help us understand Kununurra. For somebody who hasn't been there, what is the town and community like? And if it has only a little over 5,000 people, how big is your potential pool of participants? Kununurra is a very sporting-minded, outdoor-minded community because the weather lets you do it. You can plan six months in advance to go out on an outing and you can be 95% sure that that outing is going to happen. Um, the temperatures during the year, like once you've lived there for a while and accept that it's going to be hot, um, it's not a hard place to to stay in. So the, the biggest thing is the competition amongst all the other sporting groups that are in town on such a small, a small community. So, you know, you have football, you have tennis, you have soccer, you, you have basketball, netball, just to name a few of the major ones. You're actually competing against quite a few to get to get your participants. I found that the what we call the little dragons, they're the say the six to nine year olds, they're very easy. Um, they were relatively easy to fill, and most years we had a waiting list. So I, know I could only take 25 students at a time because of the instructors needed to manage 25 students for an hour, six to nine year olds. Mm-hmm. Then we you needed a pathway for them to continue on to. So then we had um, a group in the middle, which were just white and yellows, and then we had the dragons, which were nine to nine plus onwards. Um, being a smaller group, we couldn't break them up for you know yellow belts and blue belts. They you, nine plus had to train together. And this is where the tenets of Taekwondo came in and it was very good for younger people and older people to develop that mutual respect and we were very strong with that. If a blue belt is only 14 years old Mm. and knows what they're doing and what they're talking about, I would ask them to take a white belt adult. The adults, sometimes it held back because some adults don't like training with students but we have developed some amazingly great fine young people because of this concept of allowing younger people assisting adults because you were a student it didn't matter what age you were you were a student and that's all so you had to drop your ego when you walked in and now and this is the thing that warms my heart so much is that I have got a 13-year-old student who started when he was six, just got his black belt, and and because the club is struggling for a consistent instructor at the moment, he's taking um, little dragon students. That's brilliant. Being supported by his mother, supervising, keeping an eye on things like that. So how wonderful is that, a 13-year-old being backed up by a parent taking classes so the club continues. There's another lad who's been got his third dan last year and he's now taking one session a week with adults and he's only not even 17 yet 
and taking the white and yellow belt group as well on a Wednesday. And then another student who has just developed so amazingly taking another class. And that, and that's not my doing. That is the committee's doing because I left. And the instructor that, who was going to stay on for at least 12 months found himself in a situation where he couldn't do it after all. And this all happened in two weeks before we were due to start, the club was due to start up after a summer break. And the fact that some students have been there for so long and are stepping up like that is, is I think, is just brilliant for a small community to be able to continue on their training like that, providing an opportunity, a totally different type of sport to the normal run-of-the-mill sports in a small community, remote community. That is fantastic. I can see all of the obvious growth advantages and leadership advantages for the young person who is leading that situation, but you mentioned that particularly if it's an older person who has to take instruction from somebody who is half or a third of their age, that can be challenging. Once they go through that, what do you see the older person gets from learning from the younger? It's just a respect, a respect thing um, more than anything else because, you know, like respect is is a two-way streak, isn't it? You know, you can't stand there and say, you must respect me and the younger students learn that as well and I hope they carry that out into the community. The older students do seem to stay around because they can also see the advantages of when they get up to that level that there's an opportunity there for them as well. And I find it good that they do. And I must admit that when you've got one older person in with a group of younger people, there is a a little bit more stability. It is easier for that younger person to provide instruction. That's why it did work well. And as long as, as me as the lead instructor, I was mindful that that older person also needed to receive instruction, maybe from an adult from time to time then then it worked you know so there was a lot of thinking behind the scenes about how classes would be structured as well by myself to make sure that it did work but that concept that we had is certainly holding the club up at the present moment what was the philosophy regarding elite pathways versus fitness versus community participation versus individual pursuit of belts and dans how did you create the cultural priorities, if I can put it that way, within the club? I never even attempted any elite training and that was understood by everybody from the beginning and that wasn't the concept of the club at all. The students that had ability were recognised and this is where the story gets interesting because, as you would know, I'm a third dan, so I can't promote students. So we needed to get somebody to come to Karanara to do our gradings. And Mm. as the lead instructor, I needed to vet the students beforehand. When the instructor that we had come in from Darwin moved to Melbourne, it wasn't wasn't so cost-effective to bring her up to Karanara. Um, We looked at Perth, but then I remembered I'd had a conversation with um, a seventh, he was a seventh Dan at the time when I first took over. He was recommended to me because he's part of the Chungdo Kwan Taekwondo group, which is what we, the banner we train under. And I rang him out of the blue and asked him if he'd come up and do a seminar. And that was back in 2013. And he hasn't stopped going up there since the club spent a lot of the money bringing um, our grandmaster, grandmaster Adrian Hitch from South Australia up. And he has guided me and the club members along so amazingly well. I think I would have given up if I hadn't contacted him and he hadn't agreed to come and support the club because I felt out of my depth. I was getting students close to black belt and I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> Because I hadn't been coached any further in that field myself. So when he came, he started coming up and he'd give me individual training. Then I'd do a schedule for him. The poor guy, sometimes he'd go home, at, come home at night and he could barely walk because I'd worked him all day. We got our money's worth out of him. <laughs> But that's how that's how we actually kept going, how we managed to maintain and continually improve our standards through these four visits a year from uh, Grandmaster Hitch. That 
was really worthwhile um, spending the money on. So not only did he coach me, he coached younger students. To, I've got copious amounts of videos I always refer to when he came up so I could continue on with drills, the self-defense techniques and everything like that. So, But we never went for the elite pathway because it just wasn't feasible because we didn't have the qualified people to to help on a consistent basis with that so it was all about personal um, development we did though once a year travel to darwin for um, what we call the northern territory championships there was a club there that held championships and it was a sparring championship and once a year that was a major thing so can you imagine we get in the car on a friday we do the eight or nine hour journey to darwin on the friday we do sparring all day Saturday from eight o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. Then we'd all, a lot of most of us would get back in the car on Sunday and drive back to Kununurra on the Sunday, eight or nine hundred, just to attend a one day competition. And then if you got kicked out, mm-hmm. some students only got one spa because there wasn't enough to, uh, to have like a ripper charge if you got kicked out when we first started. So that talks about commitment, doesn't it? not only from me but from the parents and everybody to take the students up to Darwin for that. And that was our big annual event. So given that you were in such a competitive sporting environment, given that it took that much dedication, given that you weren't really dangling a pathway to the Olympics at the end of all of the hard work, why do you think People kept turning up. What was the magic about your club? I think the community spirit, the caring, uh, not only from me but from the committee and the parents around, the uh, application of the tenets of Taekwondo, the teaching of those tenets, you know, the discipline was based around the tenets, you know, like um, why do you have to say sorry to the class because I wasn't listening, you know, I wasn't showing respect those sorts of things, I think it it was just a nurturing, I felt that I created a nurturing environment Mm. and I I personally thrived under that environment and um, I did neglect my taekwondo, I I have to admit personally, and um, now that I'm in Albany and training again, I'm thoroughly enjoying being a student. It is hard to step back and forget that you're not an instructor and and watch all the students do their things to you know over your shoulder while you're doing your pattern but it it was just a way I just love the teaching I loved watching the students achieve and I guess when you've got that one-on-one level from your instructor and that caring from your instructor you would want to continue coming back as well and also a lot of the parents did see the advantages I've had parents come up and say, wow, their, re- their focus at school, their reading is getting better, their schoolwork is getting better, they're learning to walk away from situations rather than arcing up and, and everything like that because students knew that if they used their taekwondo and it wasn't in self-defence and self-defence was only physical, it was never verbal, like if they received verbal abuse, they had to learn to walk away you know, they weren't allowed to go up and suddenly start using their Taekwondo. And being a small community, you know, if word gets around pretty quick. So I just warned them and said, oh, no, you know, oh, no, if you use it inappropriately. And I did. So I I think it's just the caring attitude. And because it was committee-based and I I had committee to support me, I was able to be like that. Do you miss being so far away from your baby? With technology... I'm really not so far away now that COVID is um, is sort of over for WA. Uh, um, I'm going back up there in two weeks because Grandmaster Hitch can't get there. I'm going back up there for two weeks to just provide a little bit of relief to the students um, that are taking the classes, give them some help on how to run a class and, and what I did and a few tips just with dealing with difficult people, etc. Last night, just pulled a few students out of the class by video, watched them do some techniques and gave them some feedback on their pumse. We're trialling that as well. Get a, a grading happening um, by video if that can happen so that they're not held back too much this year because there's a few students who are that close to Black Belt and they've been going for six or seven years and that's the other thing about our club it takes five years to get a black belt in our club 
although Grandmaster Hitch comes up four times a year, two twice a year is for a sort of a semi-assessment and then he comes up twice a year for gradings. Sometimes we can squeeze a third third one in, but not all the time. So if you just grade twice a year consistently, it takes five years. Quite often it takes six or seven years for you to get to your black belt. And everybody seems happy with that. They're happy with that the, as long as they're progressing at the pace that they can manage, they're quite happy with that. Given everything that you have had to do with Taekwondo, picking it up later in life, diving so deeply, having to manage the personalities, having to get the most out of resources. Now you have a little bit of distance from that whole experience as well. What wisdom can you share? Now that I'm a student particularly, I think the biggest thing is don't be fearful. You know, I've always fear I've always had a fear of failure, fear that I'm not good enough. I kept telling myself that. And then when I look back at the occasions when I have dived in and done it without any fear and with a belief in myself that I could do it, they're the moments where I've taken off and grown the most. So I dived in without even thinking about running the club and it it's still going. I would say to everybody, just have a little bit more belief in yourself and I guess if Grandmaster Hitch was listening to me say this, he would be laughing so much because he he would always say to me, ye with little faith in thyself, something like that. And, and it was quite true. <laughs> so I think have faith in yourself. Don't compare yourself to others because this is your journey and make the most of it and try to attempt everything um, without a fear of failure. That would go a long way with you, particularly for older people. You know, like I was in my mid-40s when I I started and so if I've been doing it for 18, 19 years, it gives you an indication of, of, of my age. I was being way too polite to even go down that pathway, <laughs> but I'm perfectly happy that you volunteered it. <laughs> yeah, if, if you have a bit of a fear, like the other night I went to training, it was a black belt class, and at the club I'm at at the moment, the, the majority of the time I am the, the, the highest ranked black belt. That There are other higher belts, but they can't always turn up. Well, Friday night was a black belt class and there was me, grandmother age, great-grandmother age, and then the next student was 18. (laughs) So there was me. (laughs) If you let that hold you back from training with them and they were doing beautiful, amazing kicks and they've got pads. We've trained on a hard floor. I'm really struggling with balance because um, we we train all the time on soft mats and everything and, and I just sort of thought, oh, gosh. Go with it, Sue. Enjoyed the rest of the session instead of sort of beating myself up about not being able to keep my balance with some of the techniques all the time. They're the little messages that I've learned. It's interesting this podcast is made possible by Ageless Taekwondo and when you consider our school's program or the Little Dragons <laughs> as it was in Kananara and then through we've just been doing Zoom sessions with our elite athletes connecting with the community and then taking that through to Ageless Taekwondo including people transitioning from very accomplished backgrounds following the process that you are now following, it's increasingly painting a picture of how Taekwondo can be a companion for life. Oh, most definitely. You've just got to listen to your body, know what you can do and work within that. And, you know, that's the next step for me. Once um, everything is settled down with COVID and everything, I want to—I actually do want to do the Ageless Taekwondo course and see if I can incorporate that somewhere in the Albany community and also the schools program, I think, as well, because I, I think that would be something fantastic to do with um, younger kids within the schools. You've given so much, but there sounds like there's a lot left to give. Thank you so much for sharing the story of Kananara and your own fascinating story with Taekwondo. Sue Riley, thank you for being a guest on Australian Taekwondo Talk. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Now let's learn more about Ageless Taekwondo, part of the Move It Oz initiative.
In recent episodes of Australian Taekwondo Talk, we have been taking you inside the mind of ageless Taekwondo participants. What motivates them? What do they enjoy? What would they caution against? And what has it brought to their lives? In this episode, you're going to meet Trevor Houston, who is 72 years old and not entirely a newcomer to Taekwondo, more someone who has had a relationship with it in the past, but has been revived and blossomed through Ageless Taekwondo. I started by asking Trevor about his history with Taekwondo. Right, it was around about uh, 1990 when we moved to Hobart and uh, I was a mature age student. I was in my 40s and I joined uh, Joe's Club at Howrah uh, with my three sons. So that's where we started off as a family, actually. But as the time went on, the boys uh, found other pursuits to do, so they dropped out. And one of my sons got his first stand with me, and then he dropped out, went into cricket. So I kept going. I was the old man, but I kept going. Have you done it continuously since 1990? I retired from the club, I think it was about 2012. Uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. And this new format of ageless taekwondo, how similar or different is it to what you've done traditionally? Right. It's uh, obviously not as intense, but it it just keeps up your skills and uh, your fitness. And uh, no, I I thoroughly enjoy doing it. There's only a small group of us on a Wednesday morning, but uh, I really enjoy it. Can you walk us through a typical morning at Ageless Taekwondo? Right. Well, first of all, we do a a warm-up and we do stretching. Uh, We do all sorts of exercise, uh, push-ups, burpees, uh, etc. And uh, then we do uh, a routine where there's uh, stretching, legs, uh, punching, that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty varied, actually. And how long does a session go for and how intense is it? It's uh, one hour every Wednesday morning. Uh, it's probably compared to the normal club where you're, you're sparring and you're right into it, it's probably half that pace, but uh, it probably suits a 72-year-old. <laughs> What about the social aspect of it? I get the impression that it's quite a fun get-together as well, is it? Well, it is. Um, We're all over over the age of 50, some of us well over 50, but it's because we've become like a little group and of friends and uh, there's no expectations on on anyone. Uh, They come in at various uh, levels of fitness and uh, everyone helps everyone else and it's just a fun time and we really enjoy it. Do you think you have a particular advantage because you're from a Taekwondo background even though you're a relative latecomer to it in its own right? Well no doubt about that. Uh, My years uh, in full training has uh, stood me in good stead but it's uh, an opportunity to keep the skills up and uh, the flexibility and balance and that sort of thing. So I've enjoyed it. What does it do for you that, for example, walking or even a game of tennis wouldn't? What's its special advantage, do you think? Well, the big advantage is that you're exercising all aspects of your body uh, from balance, aerobics, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, you just do, you cover the whole, the whole gamut of, of exercise at the time. If somebody is listening to this, either from the point of view of an instructor who is interested in starting a class or somebody who would like to either sample Taekwondo for the first time as an ageing Australian or as somebody who, like you, would like to return to it after an absence, what would you say to them? I'd say, look, go for it. Uh, It's you, you might be out of the sport for, for years, but you can always go back in at your own pace and uh, you still you pick up very quickly what you've, what you've learned and uh, you learn a lot and uh, your fitness, physical fitness uh, is, is really good. It's, there's no question about that. You keen to keep it up? I'll keep it up for as long as I can, actually. Actually, uh, I just might add here that in 2009, I had a, a bit of a setback in that I was uh, diagnosed with a, a blood cancer. So that put me out of it for about a year and three months. But after that, I went back to it and got my third Dan. So that was testing me, I think, to the fitness and the training that I'd had and the, the, the mental stimulation. So I, I think that had a, a lot to do with it. I know the doctors said it's your fitness that's got you through where you are. 
I imagine that's something of a motivation even now, is it? Oh, yes. It's something that I'm very much aware of. And uh, the fact that I came back from that and uh, I'm, I've never been uh, fitter in all my life, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> a pretty stellar endorsement from Trevor, aged 72. That is it for this episode of Australian Taekwondo Talk. Thank you so much for your time and thank you to everyone who has played their role in making sure that this podcast gets heard far and wide. You can get us in Apple iTunes, in Spotify, via YouTube, Red Circle. But wherever you do find us, please subscribe so that each new episode gets delivered automatically to you and you don't even have to think about it. Please also rate and review because that helps other people to find us. But it's that personal endorsement, sharing it in your club emails, putting it out through newsletters, just tipping a friend into it and sending them a link. That is the really valuable stuff for us. Thanks once again for listening to Australian Taekwondo Talk and we'll see you next episode. For more information on how you can get involved with Ageless Taekwondo and a whole lot more, head to ostkd.com.au. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram too. Thanks for being a part of Australian Taekwondo Talk.